When I was a kid, I enjoyed playing SimCity, a city creation and management simulation game. In SimCity, players take on the role of a city planner responsible for constructing and developing a city. In the game, you can use tools and resources to design and manage various aspects of the city. In today's video, I have the opportunity to speak with someone who did all that, but in real life. I'll be talking with an expert in the city sector. I'm excited to welcome David Ginsberg, a former president and CEO at Downtown Cincinnati Inc. I asked David about problematic cities like San Francisco and what he would do to reduce homelessness and substance abuse on the streets. I also asked about CEOs and the qualities teams look for when hiring leaders for their companies. Finally, we discussed the current political situation in the country and what needs to be done to improve it. All in all, it was a very interesting conversation. This episode is dedicated to Cincinnati Animal Care, a nonprofit organization of David's choice. Feel free to support animals by donating directly to Cincinnati Animal Care. Without further ado, let's get rolling. Let's begin. The time that he has been around, he has been totally committed and focused on making this city as good as it possibly can be. David is a soothsayer and he had a, a winning strategy. The ability to look back in time and say, what did David see 10 years ago? And David saw things that was hard to see, but yet we are there. Good afternoon. My name is David Ginsburg, president of Downtown Cincinnati Incorporated. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Downtown Cincinnati. Once again, thanks for joining the session. I appreciate your time and look forward to a thought-provoking discussion. I'm confident that your decades of experience and wisdom will offer valuable insights to my audience. And if you're ready to begin, I'm ready to start with my first question. Great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me and I'm all set on it. Thank you, David. One significant role in your career was as president and CEO at Downtown Cincinnati, Inc. From my understanding, it was a nonprofit organization that contributed to the expansion of the downtown area. I did my research. <laughs> this is how <laughs> I understand it. And correct me if I'm wrong. Businesses would donate funds to Downtown Cincinnati, Inc. And in return, the nonprofit organization would help strengthen the urban sector's ecosystem. Did the organization you represented engage in organizing city events or fostering cross collaboration between businesses? Or was there another focus? For those unfamiliar with this kind of organizational structure, could you elaborate on what type of organization it is and are there similar organizations in other cities? Well, that's a great question. Um, and uh, many cities have organizations like this. Um, we are funded primarily through what's called an improvement district, a special improvement district. Some cities call them business improvement districts. And that's where property owners uh, in an area, usually in a downtown, uh, want to see more businesses downtown. They want to see it cleaner. They want to see it safer. They want to see someone marketing the downtown. Uh, so they levy an assessment on themselves. So uh, it's it's not so much a membership organization as it's a special assessment that property owners pay to, uh, to get uh, additional services. That's augmented by membership because many businesses, both downtown or residents downtown or even within the region, see the importance of downtown being successful to the rest of the region. And so they contribute to the to the funds as well. Um, many cities have these. Uh, they're public private partnerships. Uh, public sector the cities usually participate in them. Um, but they're they're generally go by special or business improvement districts. The crime rate in Cincinnati is relatively high, but it has dropped significantly over the past 15 years. Do you think that something like uh, the ambassador program introduced in Cincinnati helped to lower the crime rate and make the downtown area cleaner? And how, how significant was that initiative? And do you know if other cities have similar ambassador programs? And before you end, yeah, sorry, before you answer, I want to briefly mention what the ambassador program is for people who are unfamiliar with this term. Basically, they're employed individuals who have a special uniform and who patrol downtown area of the city to ensure that it's safe and clean. And please correct me if I'm wrong. No, that, that's uh, that's basically what an ambassador program is. So uh, if you go back 
you know, 20 years or even look at most cities today. Uh, what you said, you know, crime rate is very high. People maybe are afraid to come into a downtown area for a variety of reasons. One is potentially serious crime. Uh, more likely, it's more quality of life types of things. It's litter, graffiti, panhandling, that type of thing. And again, when the property owners uh, wanted to revitalize the downtown, they wanted to make sure that the environment that, you know, customers that are coming to downtown have uh, have a good experience and that it's safe and that it's clean and that it's environing and that it's inviting. The city uh, in Tampa is no different, uh, provides great services along that line. You have a police contingent that's downtown. Uh, your Department of Public Services provides people that are doing litter patrols and that type of thing. But in order to make downtown competitive with other environments like suburban shopping malls that are trying to attract people, uh, they have to do more. And that's where the ambassador program comes in. So those are people that are hired by the district. Uh, they usually are in a distinctive uniform. Uh, their primary focus is on being visible to make sure that people feel safe and that there's a uniform presence out there. Uh, in Tampa, you have the uh, the, 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 other, the yellow uh, Tesla program that's out there now that uh, is another visible thing. Uh, they do uh, uh, additional litter patrols. They remove graffiti very quickly. Um, and even more than that, the most important thing they really do is provide customer service. So they are eyes and ears on the street. Uh, so they're looking for people that look like they need directions. They're looking for people that feel like they're maybe that they uh, you know, have a question about where a business is. And so there's somebody that uh, somebody knowledgeable that can be asked. So um, they work very closely uh, with police. In fact, uh, many police departments use the term force enhancement because they deal with a lot of things that may be not illegal, not things that police would deal with, but that are just bothers that are just, you know, things that maybe make people feel uncomfortable. So uh, they provide another layer of, uh, of, of of service to make sure that the experience downtown is a good one, that it's safe and that it's clean and that it's friendly and welcoming. Before I moved to Tampa, I lived in Silicon Valley for several years. And San Francisco, compared to Tampa, looks extremely dirty and unsafe. I feel that this happens because of several reasons. But one of them, in my opinion, is the local government is trying to be overly nice, which is why homeless people are not motivated to change their lifestyle. And here is what I mean by that. San Francisco has faced challenges related to homelessness and substance abuse. And the city has experimented with various harm reduction strategies, including supervised injection sites and uh, the distribution of clean needles. The city believes that this, such efforts are aimed at reducing the negative health impacts associated with drug use. When I was a child, I learned an important lesson. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Um, when a city gives free food and needles to drug addicts, the problem will never be resolved. But this is my take on this situation. It's very subjective and I'm not an expert. What do you think about existing problems related to homeless and substance abuse in cities like San Francisco and L.A.? And how would you solve the problem if it was up to you? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And again, almost every city, uh, every city is dealing with this uh, in, in some way or other. I guess the first thing I would try to do is separate the issue of homelessness from other things that are that, that are problematic on the streets. People sometimes conflate homelessness and panhandling. They're not the same. Not every homeless person panhandles. Not every panhandler is homeless. Um, homeless people face a variety of different issues. So we're uh, the big learning in all of this is that I think that the idea of you know give a man a, a fish and he eats for a day or teach a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime that's a, a mantra that one of my predecessors used all the time. So uh, that makes uh, that it makes a good deal of sense. And what we've learned over time is that the issues on the streets, whether they be homelessness or mental illness or drug addiction, um, it's multifaceted. Uh, it's never just one cause. It's a number of different, you know, it, it can be mental illness. It can be um, loss of a job. It can be domestic problems. It can be substance abuse. There's lots of different things. So what many of these districts are doing, and I, you know, I think San Francisco is now starting to do it as well. We do this here in Cincinnati, uh, and I know they do it in Tampa, is that the downtown organizations provide outreach workers. They're people that actually go out onto the streets and engage with people that are you know, in some level of distress 
they build relationships and trust uh, to kind of learn who they are, what their issues are, um, and try to connect them as best they can with services. At the same time, housing is a huge issue in cities, and Tampa's no different. And how we you know, make sure that there's a place for everybody to, to be. So, you know, is there affordable housing? Is there housing for everybody? And how do they get connected with the housing? So what the downtown organizations do is really help to convene and collaborate to address and solve some of those problems. Um, but you're right, the left unaddressed, uh, they can really, you know, they can, they can lead to disease. Uh, they can lead to, you know, economic distress in cities. So uh, it, it's been one of the major focuses of our kinds of organizations um, really, almost from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, but what would be the first tangible steps in solving it? Or is it impossible to solve problems like this? Well, one thing that uh, I think I would tell you is that no one organization owns the problem. The problem doesn't belong to the downtown organization or any of this particular social services. So the first step is establishing collaborations between social service providers, police, uh, the downtown organization, uh, sometimes the religious community can be involved in this, medical communities can be involved in this, so that all these different entities are talking to each other, which they often didn't do. Uh, the next thing is to begin to engage the community, to, and that's the social service outreach. That's actually getting out, kind of knowing you know, who the population is, what the issues are, and almost solving problems one thing at a time. Uh, and then, of course, there are, there are some legislative things. You know, what is uh, you know what is the tolerance for allowing people to sleep in public spaces? And different cities and different places, you know, have different uh, you know different rules uh, regarding that. But uh, largely, it's the collaboration that's kind of the number one thing. Prior to these downtown organizations uh, helping to pull this all together, that wasn't happening. And then it's that outreach that's actually getting out there because I think, you know, most people would look at, uh, you know, a city uh, and say, wow, we're incredibly generous. I mean, we give a lot of money to our community foundations, to our United Way, to our social services. And they may be a little bit frustrated thinking that, you know, we're giving all this money and, you know, still we're having all these, you know, issues out on the streets. How can that happen? That's where an effective center city organization can build these collaborations to make sure that all the, 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 the that people that are in need are getting connected with all these different entities that are really there to help them, and uh, and it makes a difference, makes a big difference. David, let's talk about your current position. Something that sounds exciting to me. After your retirement at Downtown Cincinnati Inc. You now represent the organization called Executive Search Consultants. Based on my understanding, oversimplified understanding, you are the type of guy who helps organizations hire CEOs or other C-suite members. When we talk about CEOs, intuitively, a lot of people think about the very, very top of the corporate structure, but not too many people realize that above that line are people like you, um, above that CEO title, there is a board of directors that the actual owners of, of an organization. And sometimes CEOs can be on the board, but not all the time. And so the boards of directors appoint CEOs. And based on my understanding, you are the type of guy who helps the board of directors find the right fit for the company. How exactly do you help? What does the process look like? Where do you feel like your experience uh, stands out and where do you bring value to the to a, to an organization? Well, that's uh, th th that's an important question and you've done your research extremely well. So um, after uh, I retired from downtown Cincinnati Incorporated, thinking I was actually going to retire, I was 65 and was going to kind of leave the workplace. Um, there is an organization called HRS Inc. that is an executive recruitment group um, and they primarily are focused on finding C-suite or CEO level people uh, for downtown and economic development organizations. Uh, and I'd known the founding partner of that organization for many years. And he asked me to get involved with the firm because I bring something unique to the firm that most other firms don't have. And that's somebody that's actually done the job. I, you know, I, you know, I'm not a professional recruiter. I'm someone that's actually, you know, one of downtown organizations. So I know what those you know, the, not just the executives, but, you know, everyone on the staff is, is, is facing. So it's a, kind of a unique value there. So when we come into a, a project uh, to help to find a, a CEO, it's a unique situation all the time. No two cities are the same. Some cities have 
you know, very active elected officials, city council members, board members. Some have what you might call a strong mayor that makes a lot of decisions. Others have city management forms of governments. Uh, some cities have, you know, big issues with safe and clean. Others have different issues, things like transportation. So our first role here is kind of listening to the board and listening to the community to get a sense of what's what's needed. What are some of the issues that they want their new CEO to address? So we call those listening sessions, and we spend a lot of time doing that. And from the listening sessions, we develop an opportunity profile, kind of a a big job description that describes in depth, you know, what the challenges are, what the opportunities are, uh, what the qualifications are. And from there, we go about recruiting. And uh, what's good in the recruiting uh, that, that we're able to do is that most people that are looking for, you know, or, or that we want for big leadership positions are not people that are out there looking for jobs. We don't just put an ad in the paper and see who applies. Um, the people that usually make the best CEOs of these organizations are people that are currently working somewhere. They're well liked and they're well, well treated, and uh, and so we have to aggressively go to them and describe what the opportunities are uh, with the organization and see how that meets with what's with with, with what that organization desires. But the insight there that the CEO um, isn't the owner of the corporation or isn't the owner of, of, of the downtown organization, it really is the board members. It really is the stakeholders. So the CEO uh, is really hired to implement uh, the, the wishes and desires of the, you know, some of the sports analogy of the other people that own the bat and the ball. That's, uh, that's the stakeholders. And in many cases, that's uh, property owners. All right, let's continue to talk about hiring. Um, I'll share some of my thoughts on the subject, and I really want to hear your opinion on that. I feel like many organizations, especially big corporations, do not like hiring overly creative individuals, despite the fact the notion that creative individuals are less obedient is a stereotype and may not be universally true. I feel like, I still feel like there are some aspects of creativity that may appear to conflict with traditional notions of obedience. Overly creative people tend to question authority, take more risks and practice nonlinear thinking. And overly creative individual may even represent a threat to a corporation by creating a competitive product at some point in time. The bottom line is, I feel like that there is harder for people for a person who thinks outside the box to grow up in the corporate landscape versus a more predictable type. What do you think? Well, uh, that's what's so special about this field. Uh, if you go back to really the beginning of these downtown organizations, which was about 25 or 30 years ago, what was happening was suburban malls were exploding. They were just sucking all the life out of the downtown areas. And the downtown primarily property owners thought, you know, how, do, how can we be competitive with this uh, you know, how do we provide services that will make people want to be back downtown? So if you go back to those days, there were really two groups that were sort of doing things for downtown. One was the the elective, the, the city, uh, you know, the public sector was doing things for downtown. Uh, the others were things like maybe a chamber of commerce. And that just wasn't providing enough uh, enough leadership for the and advocacy for the downtown areas to to get ahead. So they found a third way. And most of the people that were the real icons, the real leaders of this field, um, they're not government veterans. They're not, you know, they're, they're not Chamber of Commerce veterans. They're usually people that came from some other field. Uh, and uh, you know, they may, in my case, I came out of the retail field. So what they were looking for was kind of a third way to get things done. And so this field has really nurtured creativity, risk taking, um, because they're private, they're nonprofit, they're able to take a few more risks and do things. Um, and I'll give you kind of a modern day example of, you know, problems that come up that you know, no one would have realized. Uh, you know, how do we solve the problem right now of getting people to come back to work in offices? You know, after the pandemic, uh, you know, people weren't coming, you know, they weren't coming into, into the office. And so the rents that those tenants pay is part of what drives the assessments that they pay downtown and the People that come into the offices are the people that, you know, eat in the restaurants and go to the theater, that type of thing downtown. And when there's fewer of them, uh, you know, that begins to create kind of a, 
uh, you know, negative, uh, a negative cycle in the downtown area. So how do you solve that? And that's where creativity, you see things like pop-up stores, you see things like the yellow Tesla program that uh, is happening in Tampa. Uh, you see holiday uh, kinds of promotions that you're seeing right now. You're seeing uh, creative use of space. So you know, many buildings that were offices are now being repurposed into residential. So this field uh, absolutely um, it, it relies on and uh, and is very encouraging of creative people. There are a lot of creative people in here. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to get results. I mean, we have to, you know, things there have to be, uh, you know, thing, thing, you know, it has to be safe, has to be clean, business has to be good. Uh, but this field is, and that's part of what I love about it. Uh, you know, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a downtown field, but it is very ripe for creative people. Uh, let's talk about different kinds of CEOs, sure. people who represent countries. Yes, it's <laughs> country CEOs. Um, who, in your opinion, should run the country? There are a lot of people who go to vote and a lot of people do so after watching video materials, um, different kinds of opinions. What do people have to think of before they go to vote, before they elect their president? Well, that's that's an interesting question. So, you know, I've been reading some recently about people who you know, think about campaigning uh, with the uh, with, with sort of the premise that people will vote their own self-interest, that, you know, big business will always vote for lower taxes or less regulation. Um, Minorities may vote for, you know, more public assistance and, you know, bigger Social Security and that type of thing. Yeah, everyone can make sort of a personal opinion about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily related to my work, but, you know, my view of it, and this would be true in the work that we're doing as well, is that the people that should be in leadership positions are people that have leadership that have a passion for the mission of the entity. So, You know, someone running a downtown organization should have a passion for the mission of the downtown organization, of the city, uh, and that everything that they do should be um, aimed at the at the good of, of good of good of the people that they're serving. I also think that's true in, you know, world or political leadership as well, that, you know, the, the people I'd like to see, you know, are, are, are I'd like to support are people that are really passionate about the, the progress and the welfare and the inclusion and the equity and the progress Uh, that their country or their city is making, uh, that it's not about a self-interest type of thing. So uh, those are the types of people um, that I think support. You know, I think there also has to be uh, an element of competence. Uh, you know, running a government is not an easy thing to do. Running a downtown organization is not an easy thing to do. So people, you know, need to look at the people that they're supporting and ask themselves, do these people have the skills and the sensitivities and the technical knowledge Um, and the vision to be able to do that well. So, the, you know, those would be the types of people that I, I wish were always, always running for elected office or business leaders. I see you, uh, there is a photograph of you and Trump, right? Is this? No, that's not, no, no, but, but, but <laughs> yeah, you're thinking of this one here? <laughs> yeah, what, what photograph? Uh, 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 quite the opposite. That's Bob Woodward. Who is it? Bob Woodward, the author. Okay, uh, okay. I don't know if you remember Bob Woodward from All the President's Men. He was one that uh, did the reporting with Carl Bernstein mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. during the Watergate scandal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, He's written many books. Uh, they're not, not complimentary <laughs> to Trump in any way. Okay. Uh, but uh, he was um, a guest speaker here at the University of Cincinnati about uh, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, I was really an honor to, to host him through uh, through his time here in Cincinnati. And so I've got that picture of him. But, uh, you know, he's a uh, I would recommend his books to all of your listeners. And uh, he's a great political commentator. I personally think and we discussed that before. And again, I'm not going to push you to answer this question. Just just make your choice. I personally think that Donald Trump is a charismatic yet potentially dangerous individual who if re-elected again, will bring more harm than good. I see a lot of, and by the way, I voted for Trump before. <laughs> so, but uh, still, I see a lot of similarities between him and Hitler. Hitler and Trump both were 
under loved by their dads. Trump's father emotionally neglected his son when he was a baby and a toddler and Adolf Hitler had some issues uh, with his dad. He he mentioned this in uh, Mein Kampf very explicitly that he could not love his father. So in my opinion, both Trump and Hitler are narcissistic people with severe complexes. And by the way, putting putting is like that too. Adolf Hitler was imprisoned after his failed attempt to overthrow the Bavarian government in uh, what became known as the Beer Hall Putsch. The events uh, leading to his imprisonment um, unfolded in November 1923. Trump had uh, Trump um, had the, his issues too. He also tried to engage people in all sorts of activities. Um, Hitler unleashed himself after he was released from prison. So I feel like, and again, this opinion is very subjective, but I feel like Trump, if re-elected, will show his true face and will begin to run all sorts of hardcore experiments with our democracy. What's your take on it? What do you think? Uh, two things. Uh, he's telling everybody what he's going to do. Not going to be a surprise. He's already doing it. Uh, the second thing I would tell you is that, you know, we talked a little bit about what, you know, you're asking me what I'd like to see in public servants or, or leaders. Um, and I gave you an answer to that question. And in my personal view, Trump is none of those things. I think uh, I think that would be a you know a very unfortunate thing. I also uh, am often puzzled. Uh, you and I talked about this a little bit too at one point. Uh, how many people that I know that are very good people? I just they're 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 big Trump supporters for one reason or another, uh, and I I sometimes have a hard time understanding it. But I do think that, you know, we have to make an effort to understand and respect uh, how other people might think about things. Um, but uh, in, in, in my view, I would tend to, you know, whatever whatever you just described there, uh, you know, I, I think Trump is already telling people what he'll do. And I really hope that uh, I, I hope that, you know, this country is, you know, s smart enough to reject that. Let's switch the topic. Let's talk about founders, people who have startups. And there are a lot of young individuals who create startups. Ultimately, statistically, the majority of these startups will fail. But what kind of advice would you give to a young individual who just starts their journey and who want to succeed and minimize risks? What did you learn throughout these years? What type of wisdom can you share with people, young individuals who don't have too much experience when it comes to relationships within the business framework? Well, I'll answer the first question first. Uh, to, to a young person who is trying to kind of figure out what they'd like to do, not just a young person. This could be someone at mid-career, late career, but if someone is you know thinking about a change or trying to think what to do, my advice would always be, just if you've got an interest in something, just get involved. It doesn't have to be at a high level. You could, you know, you could be selling shoes. You could be working as a stock person. Uh, you can be a porter at a car dealership. But just get near that business or near that activity. See if you really like it. Talk to people. You'll learn. And if and if it's good, you'll continue. You'll begin to find the path, and that's how you'll begin to grow. But don't be bashful to. Just give something a try. And if you get into it and you've given it a fair try and you don't like it, there's no shame and you know, then stopping doing that and trying something else. So uh I would think that uh, you know, it, it's just be aggressive, just go out there and, and 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 try something and see what happens. Um the other thing that I have found, uh, and and this is this has worked for me personally, and this is something that I look for uh and I hope that search committees look for this when they're out trying to recruit people for for positions is that we learn something from everything that we do you've learned something from acting uh you've learned something from your from your home background uh you know your political background you've learned something even you know in, in driving an uber you learned something and it's the people that can connect what they learn from one field to another and make whatever they then do uh even more valuable that's what really makes leaders special 
uh, and, uh, and, and, and we kind of look for that all the time. You know, people that, uh, are able to take, you know, in, in, in my case, I had a lot of experience in the retail business and then retail. What I learned, uh, was that's what's most important is customer service and quick response, treat the customers well, respond very quickly. Um, and when I began to apply that in the nonprofit sector, um, it was considered, you know, more innovative than it was in the retail sector. Uh, so the ability to relate concepts, to learn from what you're doing and apply it in a bigger way in the next step that you're doing and do it in an intentional way. Think about it uh, and, and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, I think those um, those are a, 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 they're good ingredients for success, but they're good things when people are that are looking to hire you, uh, when they see those things and think about them, uh, I think that enhances uh, a candidate's value. I started thinking about all those individuals who helped me. And by the way, you were one of these individuals okay. because you agreed to I, I join that. the podcast. Um, so when I think about my journey, I always recall people who helped me in one way or the other. Can you share some of your stories? I know you spent time working within the retail field. Maybe you can just share some of those unique moments that fundamentally and ultimately changed your life. I was, a, to begin with, I was a terrible student. I, I probably had been thrown out of every school I've ever been into. And, you know, I don't know who's listening to, who'll be listening to your podcast, but I, I may, I've made it through life without a college degree uh, because I, I just, school just wasn't, uh, what wasn't really for me. But I've had great opportunities for learning from some of the best people in the business. And um, after I retired, I started to think about the question that you're asking and writing memoirs, just little stories about you know things that had happened along the way. And one was my first boss. Uh, this would be in the Chicago area. It was in a shoe department. Uh, I was a stock boy to begin with. Uh, and his name was Mr. Siegel. He's long dead. And I think if he ever thought that I remembered him at all or thought of him as a mentor or played a major role in, in, in my success, he would probably roll over in his grave. He was kind of profane, he swore a lot, he was kind of always sweating and smoking cigarettes and cursing out everybody. And But but he knew the business. He knew that shoe business uh, inside and out, how to be successful and some of the basics there. And I was kind of at loose ends. I was selling shoes at a commission. I dropped out of college. Nothing was going well. And uh, he gave me a chance to be a frontline supervisor. And uh, I just learned from some of the things that you know he would e either philosophies that he had about business uh about merchandising um about managing a high-powered commission sales staff and i remember almost internally thinking to myself if i could ever just take what was good about mr siegel learn it and apply it and eliminate the bad stuff does not do all the stuff that you you, you could become president of the company and that's exactly what happened. And uh, so, uh, no, I think it's a, it's a great story. And I think, uh, you know, people looking back on their own careers and lives can probably think of several moments like that, that they might not really, unless they really focus on it, they wouldn't think about it, that were really pivotal in, uh, in, in either their progress or sometimes, you know, why they didn't succeed. Were there any examples when you didn't succeed, when you forgot to apply or you just ignored important advice? Yeah, there was. Uh, you, you know, as I was working my way through the department store world, there's really kind of two avenues you can kind of get to to get to the top. One is the merchandising side. That's where you become a buyer and you become the buyer's boss and you become the vice president of merchandising. And then ultimately, maybe you, you'll get up to a high level of the company. The other one is the stores organization where you're a store manager and then you get to manage a group of stores. It's a little bit more operational. And I liked the operational side better. I liked you know, managing the stores. I always thought managing a store was like being a governor of a state rather than being a buyer, which was like being a senator and just being one of one of a one of hundred. Uh, and I thought I could bypass a step. I thought I could bypass that sort of the buyer's boss uh, level. And the fact of the matter was, you know, I thought that was so clever. I, I invented a position. I sold the company. I'm giving me the job. It was a, I did the job well, but at the end of the day, uh, everybody recognized that if you want to be at the top, you're going to have to go back. You're going to have to be a buyer. Uh, and that set me back a couple of years. That was, uh, you know, that was, you know, I, I, I thought I was doing something that was going to be kind of a shortcut to the top. And it was a useful position, but it really was not a shortcut to the top. So that was a learning experience from 
uh, what I'd say was a failed strategy. David, we discussed a lot of things and I truly appreciate your time. And before we end this conversation, I, I want to give you a little bit of time for an open-ended monologue. Please share what you have learned over the years. Maybe there was something that you wanted to share, but did not have a chance to share and ultimately define success and give some words of wisdom. What is success in your opinion? Well, I appreciate the opportunity uh, and, and, and the question, because these are a couple of things that you and I have talked a little bit about, and there are things I've been thinking about more later. Uh, you know, I'm kind of at the tail end of my career. So, you know, I've retired from doing what I was doing, and this is something that I'm doing to help cities to kind of move their way forward. But if I were advising younger people now, and, 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 you know, and, and what I think is important, number one is get involved. Be aware of what's happening in your country. Be aware of what's happening in the world. And if it isn't what you want, uh, vote, participate. Uh, don't just sit in a bubble and let things happen because they'll happen and they'll happen to you. So uh, I would really encourage you know people to get their educations, to learn civics, to get to, to get very uh, to get very much involved. Uh, the other thing that I really encourage in, in everybody uh, is a sense of urgency. Uh, we used, always used to joke that, you know, when a stakeholder asked us a question in our downtown organization, I always would tell, you know, people I work with that whatever they asked you, put two letters after the question, RN, and RN just means right now. Right now is the time to, you know, address the issue. Right now is the time to solve the problem. Uh, so I think having a sense of urgency uh, is important. Uh, the third thing is what I would call upstream thinking. Uh, a lot of the issues that you and I talked about, homelessness, crime, uh, political dysfunction, uh, you know, we're dealing with kind of what's being presented to us today. This is just what's on the streets right now. Had all of us been doing more what I would call upstream thinking, we'd be thinking about what are the root causes of this? How did, you know, how did Putin get into power uh, in the first place? Uh, you know, when you have crime in the streets, you know, who's committing the crime? What could have happened that could have, have prevented that crime from happening in the first place? Why are people, you know, using drugs and taking drugs? And, you know, we have to deal with what we're presented with. But I think we have to, all of us, not just leaders, all of us have to be thinking kind of more upstream as to how do we make sure that we prevent the issues that, you know, people are going to face five to 10 years from now. How do we prevent them from becoming problems um, at all? Uh, success. Uh, you know, I think success is, you know, feeling good about what you're doing, uh, feeling like you're doing something that's important. Um, you know, to me, you know, feeling success is is helping people, is helping an organization. Uh, to some people, success might be, you know, amassing a fortune. But I think, you know, if you feel like what you've done uh, is, 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 is you know, making you feel fulfilled, uh, and you've done it in an honest uh, way with, you know, a high level of integrity. Uh, you know, we only live so long and that's, that, that's pretty good. And, uh, you know, if you have a group of friends and family, uh, and I would say pets, because I have my dog Jefferson sitting right at my side here. Jefferson. Uh, if you have that support group, uh, you, you, you're, you're pretty successful. Thank you so much, David. That was David Ginsburg a former president and CEO at Downtown Cincinnati Inc. and a partner with HRS Inc. I hope you enjoyed watching my dialogue with David. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave your comments in the comments section. I'm done for now. Ivan KV out.